Hello everyone and welcome to Music Theory with Gim. In this installment of Analyzing Counterpoint, we're going to be delving into Encounter, or Spirit Meeting, from Castlevania III, Dracula's Curse on the NES. Before we get into any music theory, however, let's take a listen to the music. The theme is set in the tonality of A, with its mode being minor. Harmonically, we have the chords A minor, B7, G minor, A7, F minor, and collectively, E7 flat 9. Looking at these chords, it's easy to begin feeling discombobulated, and that's understandable because this is a rather peculiar set of chords. This is especially so if we only consider the harmony as merely chord symbols. If we dig deeper and consider the counterpoint, however, we'll find that this theme, despite all of its chromaticism, is a simple prolongation of a standard harmonic progression. To begin, let's take a look at the basic counterpoints of the outer voices, or the bass line and the melody. The first thing we'll want to do is figure out what intervals are being formed measure to measure. Upon doing so, we'll discover a series of alternating twelfths and tenths, or fifths and thirds, in measures 1 through 4, with consecutive or parallel twelfths in measures 5 and 6. If we take a look at what notes are used in each of the twelfths throughout the six measures, we'll see that in the bass we have A, G, F, and E, and in the melody we have E, D, C, and B, both of which form descending conjunct lines. In measure 2, the descent from E to D in the melody is prolonged by D sharp. As is the descent from D to C via C sharp in measure 4. The bass, however, is not prolonged with a chromatic descent. Instead, it utilizes contrary motion to ascend by step and then descend with a leap of a third, such as A ascending to B and then leaping to G. In conjunction with the melody, the ascending bass forms a tenth rather than a twelfth. When we arrive to measures 5 and 6, however, there is no space between C and B, which is why we have consecutive twelfths rather than twelfths separated by an interposing tenth. The remaining notes that are not part of the basic counterpoints form, for the most part, a number of simple embellishments. For example, in measures 2 and 4, the melody is embellished with leaping motion to inner chord tones as a way to provide additional intrigue to an otherwise purely descending conjunct line. In measure 6, the bass line is embellished by a leap from E to G sharp. Locally, this can either be viewed as a change of position, or it can be proposed that we're hearing G sharp diminished 7. Either way, I view this as an embellishment aimed to provide additional support for a smooth return to the first measure of the loop. Also notice that in the melody we have D sharp, which, like G sharp, is a third above the structural tone, creating another set of parallel twelfths. And, like G-sharp, D-sharp is used to lead us back to the first note of the loop, only this is leading us to E rather than A. Instead of appearing as obvious parallel twelfths, we hear in the melody D-sharp offset by the interposing tones G-sharp and F. The descending leap from B to G-sharp is a throwback to measures 2 and 4, being embellished by a descending leap to an inner chord tone. The problem with this is that G-sharp is the leading tone of the tonality which creates the expectation of a resolution to A, but the theme is going to loop back to E. As a result, the melody leaps to F, which operates in conjunction with D-sharp to create a chromatic enclosure or neighbor group of E.
Interestingly enough, this use of a descending diminished third to chromatically enclose the note of the following measure also appears at the end of measure 5. This time, however, we hear C descending to A sharp as a means to enclose B. So if you have by chance been wondering why I used A sharp atop F minor rather than B flat, this is why. The horizontal plane, in my opinion, outweighs the vertical relation of the tone to the underlying chord F minor. Of course, spelling A sharp as B flat certainly makes sense locally, as it is a perfect eleventh rather than an augmented tenth, but in relation to the melody and its global design, A sharp makes more sense than B flat. It is important to note, however, that this is an episode about analysis and not performance, so I'm not really concerned if it is easier to process B-flat because we're not playing, we're analyzing. Anyways, altogether we have melodic fourths chromatically descending from A to E in the bass and E to B in the melody, with embellishments used to either provide additional intrigue or to assist the loop back to measure 1. Now let's take a look at the arpeggios we hear between these outer voices. In their original form, these arpeggios span two octaves, but nearly each octave contains the same information. As a result, we'll reduce the arpeggios to a single octave, and we'll also see them spread across four staves in an SATB format, so that we can more easily see the motion of each note from one measure to the next. The only measure that has change in the second octave is the final measure, which replaces E with D. This, however, can be seen as an embellishing tone, and as such will not be viewed as part of the basic counterpoint. Speaking of the melody and bass, we're going to find here that, like them, we have patterns of alternating intervals followed by consecutive or parallel intervals in the final two measures. For instance, between the two lowest staves we hear alternating seconds and thirds, with the final two measures using consecutive seconds. Between the lowest stave and the second to highest, there are alternating thirds and fourths, followed by consecutive thirds. And between the lowest and highest staves, we hear alternating fifths and sixths, with the final two measures having consecutive fifths. Before we listen to all of these voices together, let's cover a few points of interest. In the lowest stave, we have a line that is similar to the bass in that by overlooking measures 2 and 4, we have a descending conjunct line consisting of A, G, F, E. The difference here is that rather than ascend by step and then descend with the leap of a third in measures 2 and 4, the process has been retrograded and inverted, resulting in descending motion by a leap of a third followed by stepwise motion in the opposite direction, such as A descending by a leap to F sharp and then ascending to G. This, in conjunction with the bass line, forms a series of eighths and fifths. In the second to lowest stave, we have a very plain stepwise descent that utilizes oblique motion for measures 2 to 3 and then 4 to 5. And in the two highest staves, we have lines that mirror the core design of the melody. E descends chromatically to B in the highest stave, and C descends to G sharp in the one below. Make note, however, that in measure 5, the stepwise descent ceases due to oblique motion created by A-flat remaining unchanged, but inharmonically respelled as G-sharp. With this all in mind, let's take a listen to these four lines together. Pay attention to how structurally they all descend by fourth. A descends to E, B descends to F, C descends to G-sharp, and E descends to B. The qualities of these fourths may differ, but they are still fourths in the general sense.
Now that we have an understanding of the counterpoints between the outer voices and the inner voices, and can see all of the individual patterns, let's take a look at a reduction of the entire theme and consider the harmony. Personally, I would analyze the harmony as simply being an embellished 1-5 progression. This is because the chords of measures 2 and 4, B7 and A7, are not structural harmonies, but are prolongational chords used to enhance the motion from A minor to G minor. And G minor to F minor. That said, despite the chords G minor and F minor being of a higher structural value, they are also prolongational chords, only they are prolonging the underlying progression of A minor to E7. As a result, the harmonic progression is simply 1 to 5. This is similar to the chord progression of A minor, G major, F major, and E major, or 1 flat 7 flat 6 5, which is a very common prolongation of the harmonic progression of 1 to 5. The progression of encounter, however, is far more chromatic and quite eerie. So like I said at the beginning, this is a very simple progression. It just looks really complex because it's chromatically embellished. And now that we can see that, we're ready to take another listen to the theme in its entirety and to bring this episode to a close. For those of you that are patrons, you can expect to receive a PDF containing the analysis present in this episode. I do not expect to make any additional commentaries on this particular theme, but if I do, you'll certainly gain access to them at least a month in advance. Of course, as my patrons, should you have any thoughts or questions regarding this analysis or the theme as a whole, certainly reach out to me. For those of you that are not patrons but would like to support my endeavors, be certain to subscribe to the channel, like the video, comment below, and share the video as often as you can on social media platforms. If you find yourself wanting to take your support to the next level, hop on over to patreon.com forward slash gim and consider pledging some coin. If you are not a user of Patreon or simply want to make a non-recurring financial contribution, you can do so at coffee.com forward slash music theory with gim. These videos do take a lot of time and effort, so any support on your end is greatly appreciated. Either way, until next time, thank you for watching this episode of Music Theory with Gim.